Welcome back, everybody. It is, well, it's Enterprise Dish time. It's the end of the month. We're wrapping up the month of August. And as we always do on the last week of August, well, well, the last week of August, the last week of the month, if I could enunciate and think correctly, we invite Mr. Rick Vanover, who's a little north of I am, uh, to come hang out, talk security. We're going to be talking a little bit about Google this week. And uh, how's it going, Rick? Well, it's going great. And it's weird because uh, it's weird for two reasons. One, I'm not traveling, yeah. right? Usually you catch me in interesting places, but I'm not at VMworld, which yeah. is a giant event this week. I made the decision not to go. I uh, hmm. It was hard. I had two yeah. Veeam trips to Argentina and Brazil. Okay. And then on the other end of this week, I have China. So it would have been Ooh. four weeks in a row with pretty big endeavors. Yeah. And while VMworld is in the US, that's not an easy week for, for us at Veeam. So I just made the decision. I'm like, I can't do it. So this is the first time in like 11 years, I can't do that. Wow. Yeah, but, but you know, I mean, there's a lot to be said about mental sanity and it's not like you're not traveling. You didn't just skip it just to skip it. You skipped so it because true. you're quite literally traveling all over and I, I don't blame you one bit but there's been a lot of news out of there a lot of kubernetes stuff um just general updates across the vmware board anything that jumps out at you or you know i, I want to look into a little bit more of this project pacific mm -hmm. i mean it, it the, the container cloud native app kubernetes bit i, I don't know much about it right yeah. but i'm feeling like it's more than just uh, it, it's it's getting real. And I'll give you an example. I spoke to um, actually a group I used to work with. And I was I was an employee there. I worked mm -hmm. as an IT admin. And I saw this team or parts of this team. Uh, you, you ever work somewhere? And maybe a lot of these listeners can relate. A lot of mm -hmm. IT groups, they're lifers. Yeah. You know, they're just long-term people, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I moved around a bit, but I have lifer in my DNA, so I get it. But one of these individuals is very lifer, right? And uh, he has been with the company for whatever team, 20 years. And I only spent two years there. And it's one of the few jobs that I ever say I wish I didn't quit. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy where I'm in. I am at now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, especially soon after, it was a good job. And, you know, for a while, I wish I didn't leave it. I mean, things changed and I'm different sure. now. But I had a great conversation with the guy. And I said, what about this? application that used to give us so many fits mm -hmm. and because you know as an admin this was one of those things that used to just throw more hardware at they're actually retooling the application to be a containerized app in the cloud mm -hmm. and I'm like whoa and they're recoding it exactly the same spec and it becomes incredibly scale out really easily that way Right, so that that was one example that I could get my head around sure. containerized cloud native apps, and I had, I don't know, two hour conversation with him about this app that I hadn't touched in like nine years, mm -hmm. but I knew what it did. It was yeah. very central to my day to day. Right, so I think of, I'm gonna have to tar start taking that seriously. Well, I actually do because I have somebody <laughs> on my team focused on it already. Yeah. one person on my team is that's their specialization is cloud native and containerized apps. Gotcha. But when I look at, you know the market momentum, the market news, when you get a big player behind it, like VMware, especially if you look at their Heptio acquisition and how it's progressing through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting a little bit real. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. I mean, just other things going on. Uh, as you're announcing some stuff today, if you're, if you're in Switzerland, um, you can go and now get uh, Azure related services directly from the data center that's on your property. So, oh, yeah. wow. Azure, you know, I've been working a lot with Azure. We were mm. talking about this recently, but um, I am very impressed with how they're adding new services and and adapting services. In fact, I've actually just, you know, Brad and I were talking, I've been working a lot on Azure, like security mm -hmm. and administration as well as Azure storage and specifically for Azure storage services, both security and administration. And what I've learned is that you have to keep up with Azure because it will move on without you. And mm -hmm. I'll give the listeners one practical tip. And I wrote a blog about this a couple weeks ago, but I actually recommend every day starting your journey in Azure, going right to the Azure advisor. Hmm. Just when you log in, go there first. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. this is very important because if you're like me with Azure, you're adding services, you're taking things away, you're making changes, you know, those resources come and go. 
But Azure Advisor is going to reassess based on what you have, but also how the best practices evolve and how uh, the services change. So for example, if a service implements a new enhancement, you know, you don't necessarily automatically upgrade that service. Sure. Best example is general storage V1 to V2. They don't okay. upgrade you automatically, but Azure Advisor will alert you, hey, this could be upgraded, right? So hmm. just a practical tip, always start in Azure Advisor so that you can know what's the best tip uh, of the day, know what's changed, you know, look for the red and go address that first. I'm pretty happy two or three of the four categories for me are following all of the Azure best practices. And there's mm -hmm. one that I'm like mentally okay with the yellow, uh, just because I don't want to enable Azure soft delete and stuff like that for this particular type of data, right? But the Azure Advisor, uh, I think I fell into my own soapbox here, Brad, but um, <laughs> the Azure Advisor is a great way to start your uh, a day in the administration of Azure. And but, you know- That's at, a good tip. Yeah, yeah. It really and, is. And when you think about what's going on in Switzerland and then soon in the other parts of the world where they're going to have more uh, Azure offerings, I think it's important to reassess where you put your data because mm -hmm. uh, I think if Microsoft or the same thing for Amazon, if they had it their way, every major country in the world would have an offering Oh yeah. so that that whole – it's basically democratized on data sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. So as areas and options become more – accessible and in your own geo, you actually might need to think about moving different related Azure services or any cloud yeah. service. Right? So definitely watch that. I mean, what's the best way to keep, you know, I wonder if there's a website, maybe Petri, mm. that you could follow all this Azure news. Well, where could you go for all this information, yeah, Brad? I, there's probably a good Petri.com. I and mean, actually Scott just wrote up things about Azure Ultra Disks, which just came out, which if you need the best of the best performance, you can go grab well, I'd recommend go reading his stuff because he's way more knowledgeable about that specific feature than I am. But it's um, the thing I like about your tip, though, Rick, is and I am very much guilty of this, especially when it comes to Windows, is that you kind of just you don't read the manual anymore. Right. You just kind of blow through it and like just go right into the weeds. And getting back to basics is such a critical task that we often lose sight of because it's like, oh, I know what's new. I know what's coming. But you got to you really just starting with that advisor could make your day just a little bit better or honestly avoid some catastrophes that are going on. Right. Well, and actually end your day at advisor, too, to make sure yeah. that what you've done in that session does not introduce a red flag. Mm -hmm. Right. And every Azure yep. service and resource and configuration at the very top has a link to the tech documentation. Yeah. So it's very um, Azure from a those who use the technology, Azure's doing a really good job of making it safe for yep. you. So, yeah. Which is important because, oh, there, I meant to, I meant to grab this stat right before, but there was a, a um, I think it was like 50 municipalities were all attacked like within like an hour of each other with ransomware from the same string or same person or whatever. Uh, because going after municipalities is, is shown to be a very profitable way because you think about it, obviously Veeam, for example, has extremely good security because they're a corporation. That's kind of what they do. But municipalities sometimes don't. Let's just be honest. Like I'd love to think the little city that I live in is using the, you know, the latest and greatest standards, but we all know that they're not. And so it was just yeah. interesting that, you know, that's, that's where the cash cow is currently. I'm actually starting my next uh, paper on mm. ransomware. I'm trying to uh, the the titles beat ransomware. Right? Yeah, I, I, I'm just sick of it. Right, we had that other podcast on it. I saw that news. You know, it, it, ransom. It's a it's a moving target. Yes, I've written other papers on ransomware, but that's mm. not enough now. We need to reassess and redo. And oh, here's sure. a practice. Here's a practical tip for the listeners because ransomware is on the news. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I shared this already, it's still good. So yep, it's okay. You know, a lot of people hate tape, mm -hmm. but tape is actually probably the most resilient specimen against ransomware because it's completely offline except when yep. you're writing to it. Uh, somebody that uh, in Switzerland, of all places, reached out to our senior VP of product management and gave a brilliant tip, Brad. And I realized everybody's got a story of how tapes let mm -hmm. them down and a lot of people want to put data in the cloud, but this tip was brilliant. They're only keeping the first seven days of backups on tape. They mm. keep 
many, many months or years and on disk and in the mm-hmm. cloud or whatever. But the thought is if ransomware came, they oh. have the most recent restore points offline. Mm-hmm. And by only keeping seven days or maybe even two, whatever yeah. you want, by keeping a very small amount on tape, you actually don't have this archaic library mm-hmm. of thousands of tapes and years and years of data to catalog, right? That is interesting. I like that. About that. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. For the short it, tail, not the long tail. It, it, it makes a lot of sense because if you get hit with ransomware, you're more than likely going to know it pretty quick. And you want the most recent restore point. Yep. Always. Yeah. Your because time value yeah. of that data deep is less. Hmm. Something to think about. No, it, it, I'm sure somebody will have a, an edge case or a scenario where that doesn't make sense, but I can definitely see how for a large population, that would actually be a pretty smart idea. Well, especially if you're considering cloud, but you have a tape yeah. infrastructure. There you go. And you don't want to invest too much more in a tape infrastructure. So yeah. Anyways, practical tips every day here. Who knew? Yeah, I know. We should just call this uh, practical tips daily. I mean, that's um, <laughs> we and in full transparency, Rick and I did a uh, a webinar yesterday. And when I say Re- Rick and I did it, Rick did a webinar, and I came along for the ride. But well, we were having a really button, so. <laughs> we were having a really interesting conversation about G Suite. We're like, ah, we'll just do that for the podcast tomorrow. And like, we haven't even gotten to it yet, uh, just because of things that have popped up. But I do want to kind of pick your brain here on on the G Suite. It's the way the conversation got started is, is actually if you want to also write on Petri.com, I'm looking for somebody to help cover G Suite. And it's just something that you can't really ignore anymore because Google came out with their first Chrome OS enterprise devices backed by Dell. And while I don't think it's going to unseat Windows or Office 365 anytime soon, It's also not like you can't ignore it. I mean, it's definitely getting momentum and has market share that is becoming sizable. Well, there was a time that, you know, there was another collaboration platform Mm -hmm. um, like Novell with Word, uh, Word Perfect, Lotus, one, two, three. Right. And honestly, that was in the 90s. Microsoft won that battle. But there's also something that Microsoft is then becoming. It's a target. And a big player like Google has Mm -hmm. the chance to at least be a strong number two for that platform. And, you know, one area, Brad, that they're doing it a lot is education. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially Uh, here in the U.S. Yeah. My daughter is like a master at Google Docs and Mm -hmm. G Suite and presentations and stuff like that. And the funny thing is I can't even spell G Suite, right? But I can understand what she's doing. So what – What Google have done is make the barrier of entry from a usability standpoint really low for this technology, building into the browser and Mm -hmm. having it, you know, not really require any software and just accessibility is very high. And there's probably a shed load available for free. Shed load is an okay word, by the way. It is. It's with with a D. Mm -hmm. But anyways, (laughs) um, yeah, I think it's a real formidable player here and, um, you know, Microsoft's moving a lot to, you know, the subscriptions as well. And, uh, you know, all those different factors are in play. But I think that G Suite is going to be absolutely that number two or higher. I mean, there's always going to be these like uh, the open offices and the like of the world. But I almost know if that won't transition to the kind of the collaboration SaaS era, whatever Mm -hmm. this will be called. Right. I don't know what the segment is even called, but. Because it's changed by being subscription and it's changed by being online versus something that you just, you know, install and go with, right? But I, I yep. you know, I spend a lot of time on planes. I want to read stuff. I want to look at stuff. I, mm-hmm. you know, write stuff, right? So, you know, it's hard to do all of it without the internet. Yeah, and that's why we see, well, I think we can probably both agree on that word presses aren't anything special anymore. Um, PowerPoint copies aren't really anything special anymore. I mean, people, there are tons of alternatives. It's Granted, programming them does take time and it takes skill and effort, but it's not like it was in the mid-90s, like building a word processor, right? It's relatively easy, and that's why we see Microsoft pushing towards uh, making Microsoft Teams because it's really well integrated. And I also think that the stickiest part of Office, which nobody has replicated fully yet, is Excel because we both know that um, a lot of accounting offices run on Excel. We'd like to think that they're all running on some great fan. They've got a spreadsheet somewhere. And until all of that can transfer seamlessly into another product, they're going to have trouble getting away from from that. Excel might be a tougher one to knock out. 
you mm-hmm. know, um, Lotus one, two, three was hard to knock out yep. for a very long time. When I started my IT career, I would install office. They'd use word and PowerPoint and not Excel. Yep. And, and I don't know what era or what time it was. It was around 98, 97, 96 is like when we just kind of walked away from, from one, two, three, you mm-hmm. know, but, uh, that was my personal story, but everyone's is different. And it also depends on, you know, individual skill sets and yep. these types of things almost take generations to shift. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've all been there, you know, a decision to change an app and change a process. There's always resistance, right? But um, the, that might be one in the financial services that are going to be really, really difficult to dethrone. And then, or even just people building business processes, yeah. not even limited to finance. My particular experience was in finance, but uh, anybody who manages a business function, you know, mm-hmm. can run off of Excel. But um, I, I think it's also very likely that we'll see the new generation, you know, millennials in the workforce. I don't want to say they don't care, but they'll adapt a little bit easier, yeah. you know, the, the digital first types. Um, and the other side of that, from a prediction standpoint, is, you know, me, I'm a little bit older in mm-hmm. my career and all, but like, I am willing to change because, you know, you and me, we're very technical and all that. But sometimes my needs are actually very simple. In fact, I was joking the other day that I remember when I was in college, I bought Microsoft Word 6.0 at the bookstore. And I'm pretty sure my word processing acumen is not very far off from what I could do (laughs) back then. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference is, you know, Times New Roman is not the default font anymore, right? So if you think about skill and use cases right it's the the capabilities of these platforms are so high but what do people actually use and honestly that's a one percent that go deep in some of those things and uh, I, I mean i'm fancy in powerpoint now but hey that's that's another thing so my uh my f- the first email client i used in a professional workplace was uh lotus notes oh i used eudora and then i went to lotus notes and I had Outlook or Lookout, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, for a while. And then um, I called it Lookout when it was early on because it was a little rough. <laughs> now it's okay. We can call it Outlook. But, um, yeah, I've done them all, I think. I had, I have even had some ones I don't remember, of course, browser-based. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was. that's an interesting journey. Lotus, Lotus Notes was not one that I missed. And, by the way, people still use that because they've built apps around it. It's still out. Yeah. I know. it. We get questions on how to back it up every day. Ugh. Well, I well they're not using it for the email. It's just an app. So it's, yeah. I guess before SharePoint was a thing, people were, you know, those types of yeah, use cases. Yeah, like 20 years. I could see that. Years, so. Well, Mr. Rick, as we wrap it up here in the back of the book, you've obviously got some travel coming up. You've been some places recently. You're actually posting a lot of photos online. You got any, any hot tips for us before we shut it down? The only tip um, I'll offer is to – Get out and see stuff. And what I mean mm. by that is, you know, I had an opportunity when I was in Argentina. You, you ever be at the decision point, Brad, where it's like, do I do I take an Uber or do I walk it yep. or yep. take the subway? I decided to walk it. And, mm. you know, you see a lot more. And I had yeah. a little real, real treat last night or last week when I was in Argentina. I was walking back from an event before I walked out to dinner. I mean, I could have just jumped in a car and missed mm-hmm. it. But – I looked up at the sky there in Argentina and I saw the Southern Cross, which is a stellar constellation you can mm-hmm. only see in the Southern Hemisphere, mm-hmm. right? So granted, you can look up and see things. You can look left, right. But if you fly somewhere, you don't see that much. If you take a car, you don't see as much. But if you mm-hmm. ride a bike, you see more. If you walk, you see more. Just make the small choice to take it in and see, even if it's your day-to-day. Who knows? Yep. You might find a $5 bill on the ground or something. Yep. When uh, when my wife and I travel, especially before we had kids, our favorite thing to do would be like when Rome, we'd find out where we'd want to go. And then we take the long way to get there by walking yeah. off the, the beaten tourist path. And that was always our favorite thing to do. We did it in Paris. We did it in a bunch of different places. Right. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, off the beaten path, the slow route, you know, even within the hustle bustle of work, you know, mm-hmm. I, f- I find the time sometimes and it becomes an opportunity to put, you know, relaxation and enjoyment every step of the way. Fantastic, Rick. Well, we very much appreciate you taking time out of your busy travel schedule. To everybody else, thanks for tuning in. Make sure to hit the subscribe buttons down below, and we'll catch all of you right back here next time on The Enterprise Dish.